Hello there. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Ewan Semple. I'm going to be uh, hosting this evening and asking Andy some questions once he's finished his presentation. Um, Andy and I have known each other for probably about 12 years, I guess, maybe even more. Thank you. Not as old as I am. <laughs> um, through School of Everything, which was one of the organisations that Andy was involved in in those days. But obviously more recently he's been very active in helping organisations feel better at work, I guess, and more psychologically balanced with the campaign Mind Apples. Um, so as I say, I'm going to host the evening. Andy's going to speak for about 20 minutes. A request from the RSA that we turn our mobile phones to silent, not off because there's also a request that we tweet about the event. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag RSA Mind. And uh, the reason for the phones is that the video is being streamed and it's just to uh, avoid intruding on those who are watching remotely. Uh, so at that point, I think I'm going to hand over to Andy. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> i grab my magic wand of power. Let's see if this works into a, into a pig. There you go. OK, good. Thank you for coming, and thanks to the RSA for hosting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here on, a, uh, on this stage where so many people who've inspired me have spoken and at an organisation that I've been involved with behind the scenes for a number of years now. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to be out here in the spotlight and uh, teaching, talking to you about something that's really uh, a subject close to my heart, but also hopefully by the end of this will be close to your hearts as well, or at least front of your minds. And it's time to talk about our minds. And I want to open with a question, which is, when you hear the term mental health, what's the first word that comes into your mind? Come on, be honest. Crazy, Crazy thank you. Healing. What was that one? Healing. Healing. Uh, what else? Illness. Illness. What else? Poor, poor mental health, what was that? Work, Work. interesting, yes. <laughs> and what's the first word that comes into your mind when you hear the term physical health? Well-being. Well-being. Health. health, the gym. <coughs> Hospitals. Hospitals, yeah, okay. So sometimes there are negative associations, but on, on the whole, you'll notice what happened here is very typical to what happens whenever I ask that question, <laughs> which is... The, the, the term mental health has a lot of negative associations with it. It has a lot of, uh, a lot of stigma attached to it. We tend to think, uh, oh, you know, illness, crazy, depression, schizophrenia, misery. Um, and physical health, it's, oh, it's the gym, five a day. Uh, you know, enjoying yourself, enjoying your quality of life. And uh, physical health is kind of sexy. Mental health, not so sexy. And so what we've been doing at MindApples for a number of years now is to try to make mental health sexy. Uh, as a friend of mine once said, uh, Mind Apples aims to do for mental health what Fifty Shades of Grey has done for S&M. <laughs> to sort of put it on the coffee table. Well, not literally, that, but you know what I mean. And uh, there is, there, this, this is something we need to talk about a lot more because actually we all have mental health. And what we do makes a big difference to our minds. And so we should be talking about it in the same way as our physical health. It is as important. And, and yet we don't. And, and polling that Mind Apples did with the mental health charity Mind a couple of years ago, we, we discovered that actually almost three quarters of us feel that mental health and well-being is not discussed openly enough in UK society. And, and actually more than half of the people we spoke to had never thought about what they could do to look after their minds before. And yet... The door is open. We know instinctively that our minds are important. And when it's pointed out to us, we go, oh, yes, of course, right, mental health, that's important, isn't it? And actually, almost everybody said that they thought their mental health was as important as their physical health. And what's really interesting is that, again, more than half were interested in knowing more. So there is a real gap here. There's something that we've missed in our society, and that's the gap that we've been aspiring to plug. And there are an increasing number of organizations and individuals noticing that, perhaps some of them in this room tonight. And so that's what we're at this tipping point, I think, is, is that we may actually be at the point where we know enough to at least begin to start teaching the general public about how our minds work. Of course, we don't know everything. This is an emerging science. Neuroscience in particular is still relatively in its infancy. And yet, there are a lot of things that we generally seem to be converging on that we agree on. And so there's a lot that we could talk about. And so that's why we wrote a book. 
And so MindApples uh, has been working with uh, large companies, actually over the last four years, to teach people practical insights about how our minds work, to help people work better and feel better. And we wanted to put all that down into a format that could get a wider access to it, so that more and more people could get access to this, to see whether it's useful, for, not just for people in large banks and multinationals, but to the general public, to people in startups, people working for themselves. And so uh, a Mind for Business, which uh, is, uh, we're launching here tonight, I suppose, is, is our, uh, our collection of all the practical insights from psychology and neuroscience that we think are useful for working smarter and more sustainably. And that's what I want to showcase here for you tonight. And really, our, 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 it's no surprise at all, I think, that businesses are interested in this, because uh, businesses are basically just big buildings full of brains. That's really what a business is these days. In the knowledge economy, the performance of any business depends on the performance of the minds of its staff. And so the book and the training program behind it and all of our work with businesses is really about understanding how we think, how we feel, why we do the things that we do, and understanding why other people do these things as, as well so that we can work better together and manage ourselves better. It's about building psychologically safe workplaces where people can contribute their best work and feel good while they're doing it. And it's about generally improving not just the well-being of companies, but the performance of companies too. We think that there is a win-win there between the individuals feeling good in their work and also in those organizations uh, having a competitive edge. And really this boils down to making the most of our minds in everything that we do. And so I just want to give you a little snippet about the kind of content that I'm talking about here because it can be a little bit abstract. Well, let's, let's, let's look at what we mean by a mind. So I'm just going to give a little, little bit of a taster of the sort of thing that we mean when we talk about these insights. Uh, and so, uh, again, I want to ask you another question, which is, um, could you just point to your mind for me, please? Just point to your mind. Very good. Most people are going here. There's a couple of people doing that. Someone doing that. Uh, and now, could you point to yourself, please? Most people went there. Someone did that. That's good. Someone, oh, that's, that's quite exciting. So, as a kind of all the way up and down thing they're going. I'm express myself through the medium of dance. And, uh, and isn't that interesting? Most people will go, mind, oh, that's here. And then self, oh, hang on, that's sort of here. And yet, the experience of being in our minds is very much the experience of being ourselves. This is the kind of the, the window through which we navigate reality. And so when we're talking about a mind, we need to get a bit of a grip on what that means. But in fact, what we usually are talking about when we point to there, we, we actually really mean our brains. And that is the story that we've often got, is that we are our brains. That the, the science of neuro, you know, neural scanning has shown that we have all of these extraordinary things going on in our heads when we experience all of the things in our lives. And so it's almost as if we could sort of cut off our heads and have ourselves frozen and then we come back as, exactly as we are or have ourselves uploaded to the web and we would still be basically ourselves. And, and so that's kind of become our sense of self. And it's not a bad place to start because the brain is quite a, uh, an important part of a mind. It's pretty much the key one. So it's no, no shame in starting there. And, and so let's look at how your mind is actually how your brain has evolved. Uh, and your brain, actually, this is a, an old model of the brain, but it's still relatively current. It's the triune model of the brain. And uh, it, it suggests that there are three different sort of areas of, of our brain that correspond to different stages of evolutionary development. And so at the back, in the sort of brain stem, you have uh, the, the kind of primal part, uh, uh, which is sometimes known as the lizard brain. And this is the part that we share in common with all kinds of uh, animals. And so this is where all the things that you need to keep you alive live. So uh, it gets your heart pumping, uh, makes you eat food, makes you... Uh, uh, want to, you want to sleep, uh, makes you wake up again, makes you uh, want to procreate. It's, kind of, it's basically the bit of your brain that you have left over by about 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. It's, it's sort of, you no know, one's going to sleep with me, so I'm getting a kebab. It's kind of that bit. And we spend quite a lot of money in order to reduce ourselves back to lizards, because it's quite fun being a lizard. Uh, but we can do better than that. And so around that, we have this limbic system, the emotional part of our brain, which is, uh, 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 regulates the more complex, instinctive, and intuitive parts of our, our system. So this is where we get things like aggression and risk-taking. It's where we feel happy and sad and disgusted by things. And, and, and it's also where body temperature is regulated, because lizards are cold-blooded. So that's where that goes. But then we can do better than that, because uniquely, uh, as humans, we have this thing called the neocortex, which is the kind of intellectual part of our brains. And this is the bit that's much larger in humans than any other animal. And this is the bit that does abstract thought. 
and all the things that we like to think of as being very distinctly human. And so this is planning and organizing and, 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 and learning and creativity. And it's actually, it, it, it's the part that regulates inhibition. Uh, and inhibition we often talk about as being a bad thing, but actually it's very useful. It's the part of your uh, mind that says, I'm not going to go and do the talk yet. I'm going to put clothes on first, because if I go to the talk naked, then I'll be arrested and I'm shamed and it'll be a terrible disaster for my career. So I'm going to in interrupt my instinct to leave the house and I'm going to dress myself. And this is what separates us from other primates. Uh, but the trouble is that we have all of these very intellectual, kind of higher order human thoughts buzzing around our head, but they're built onto what is still essentially an animal brain. And so what actually happens is that we think, well, you know what, I, I'm getting a bit hungry and I could really, really kind of need to eat something. And actually, I really fancy a cake because I just saw someone else having a cake and I want a cake because it's not fair, I want a cake. But actually, I just read something in the paper that said that cake's quite high in sugar and I'm sort of trying to cut down on my sugar because I'm a bit worried about, about all these health risks that I keep hearing about. Um, and actually, I'm a bit worried I'm putting on weight because you know, I feel like my, my partner's not going to fancy me anymore. So you know, actually, damn it, I'm, I really shouldn't have a cake. But you know what, the more I think about this, the more tired I get and the more I'm starting to really crave sugar. And so actually, damn it, I'm going to have the cake because it's, it's only Wednesday and I'm really tired so I'm going to have the damn cake but I'm going to justify it to myself by saying I'm going to the gym later. <laughs> and, and this is why it's quite complicated being us because all of these impulses actually are traveling around one single mind. These are not different parts of your mind. They are simply structural areas where all these functions exist. But we experience it all as one. And so we go around doing all kinds of stupid things. And then we tell complicated stories about why we did it. And then we do really, really smart things. And then we go, oh, yes, I meant to do that. And we think, oh, why did I do that? That's really exciting, isn't it? And the whole thing actually gets very complicated. And, and so we end up sort of out of sync with ourselves. We're not quite sure what's going on. And it gets even more complicated than that, because actually, it's not just about your brain. There are, there are over 500 million neurons in the human digestive system. There are neurons in your heart. That we, we have a whole nervous system which is feeding these impulses around. And so that sense of yourself as being here is actually closer to the mark. You know, we are actually in very complicated uh, systems here, all experiencing the world uh, as one mind. And, and so what this means is that this, this idea that we've had of ourselves, particularly in work, but it persists uh, through a lot of our lives, actually, is that we're, we're kind of perfectly rational. You will hear people saying, oh, you shouldn't be so emotional about things. Or, you know, we've really got to be quite, you know, quite rational about this. You know, or even the economic models of saying you know, these independent, rational actors about how we're all making rational choices. And in fact, we kind of know, and increasingly it's being proved to us, that we don't really work like that. And so, for example... It, it's becoming quite clear that decisions are quite emotional. It's not just enough to think things through. We need to feel our way to answers. And so actually, patients who have lost their emotional uh, systems through damage to the brain will report being relatively calm about things, but present them with even something as simple as a menu to choose what they want for lunch, and they can't make a choice. They go round and round in circles, saying, actually, you know, what, maybe I should have the chicken, but I'm not sure. Maybe I should be vegetarian, but actually I'm not sure if vegetarian food will fill me up enough. And, but actually, maybe I should have meat because the, the chef might be French, but I'm not sure if the chef's French. It's just a French restaurant. And they go round and round and round and never really come to a decision on it. And you need that emotional impulse to say, you know what, we've just got to get on with this. And that's a really important part of how our minds actually work. And there is a, there is a lovely uh, example of this from, uh, from old philosophy, which is known affectionately as Buridan's ass, which is the, after the French theologian Jean Buridan, uh, which it proposes the idea, which is one of my favorite ideas in all of philosophy, which is of a perfectly rational, perfectly logical donkey that is placed exactly equidistant between two identically sized piles of food and starves to death because it can't make up its mind which one to eat. And we are not designed to be like the logical donkey. We are designed to do stuff, even if it's stupid, just get on with it. And so actually that's something we need to factor into how we work and how we think of ourselves. We also are learning that mental energy is finite. Controlled thought is actually quite a physical process. It, it will tire you out the more you do of it. So exercising willpower to control your impulses or thinking through complex decisions will actually deplete your mental resources. And the more you do of it, the worse you get at doing it. And you're not necessarily aware of that, but you should be taking it into account. And there was a the classic study on this is of judges in Israel. And should you ever be on parole in Israel, I don't know what your lifestyles are like, but you never know. It can come, come in handy, this stuff. Try and be the first person seen in the morning or after lunch. Because in those settings, you've got about a two-thirds chance of going free. That figure drops to nearly zero chance the longer that judge goes without taking a break or having a snack because they get too tired and they can't think about it. And so they just send people back to prison. 
And then, they, of course, they weren't aware of it, and so when they were pointed out to them, they were appalled because they, want, they see themselves as being very rational and making considered choices, but the reality is very different. And this is something that actually is starting to cross over into some areas of how we design our, our lives and work. And imagine what it would be like if we designed our workplaces, our banking system, the House of Commons to conserve our mental resources. Would we make better decisions? I think perhaps. And Barack Obama has actually even applied this to his presidency. He read this study and he gave an interview for Vanity Fair a few years ago where he said you need to focus your decision-making energy. You need to routinize yourself. So perhaps there is something for us to learn there. And, and the other thing is about stress, that we hear a lot of talk about stress. You will hear people saying a little bit of stress is good for you. This is not really true. Pressure can be good. We like challenge. We like to hit targets that we weren't sure if we could hit. But pressure is the point where, uh, pre stress is the point where the pressure gets too much and it starts to harm your health and your performance. And it particularly is bad for making us take risks. Men, particularly when they're under stress, will tend to take decisions faster and make more risky decisions. And this is where you get the you know, all-male boardrooms, for example, when they're, they're, there's a problem in the company and you just get that, that people saying, we've just got to roll the dice on this one, fellas. We've got to punch our way out of this crash. And then looking back a couple of years later and thinking, why did we think that was a good idea? What was going through our minds? So we need to get a grip on it. Asking people to be stressed at work is a great risk for the business. How many more corporate disasters do we need before we start to realize that we can't manage our minds like that and we can't manage our people like that? And because we're not evolved for our environment. Stress is an ancient fear response designed to keep us safe from tiger attacks. It's not so useful for regulating interest rates. And so we need to get a grip on it. And what this really is all boiling down to, you can see where this is heading. We have to update the way that we design our companies, our institutions, our society to take more account of our human nature because our sense of self is changing. And here we are in the heart of the Enlightenment with these great Barry paintings around us where so many people over so many centuries have talked about how to bring reason and enlightenment to humankind. And actually the, the view we have of ourselves is still relatively, I guess, Judeo-Christian in this country at least and in a lot of the Western world. It, it's still based on this idea of dualism, this body and soul. And that the flesh is sinful and weak and drags us into base pursuits and, and the soul is angelic and lifts us up higher to some kind of uh, greater good. And, and what happens in the Enlightenment is that that idea of a soul gets swapped out and replaced with reason. And so instead we get this idea of the reasonable person, the rational human that can rise above our animal nature and to become, uh, I guess, still basically angelic. And, and what we discovered in the 20th century and increasingly in this century is that people who think they're perfectly rational are very easy to sell shoes to. And so we have been slowly learning that actually it doesn't matter how clever you are, it doesn't matter how good you are at thinking things through, you are still just as susceptible to a whole bunch of very basic things about our nature. And so what we really need to do is recognize that a lot of the power in our minds doesn't come from this bit that we're conscious of, this bit that we think of as being ourselves. It comes from the huge body of unconscious processes that that conscious self rides around on, the unconscious mind. And because that is actually where a lot of the heavy lifting goes on in our, in our minds. While you're listening to me saying all of this, then your heart is beating, um, you're, 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 you're breathing, you've got some kind of sense of a body clock, you've maybe got a to-do list of things, you know, you can go, oh, Christ, the kids, or whatever it might be. And, and, and all of that is happening, leaving you free to think about important things like cake. And Jonathan Haidt, who has also spoken on this stage about, I think, part of the, this very topic, in fact, has a lovely phrase for this, which is the elephant and the rider. And, and this is actually a, comes from a quote from the Buddha, which is the Buddha likened the mind to a wild elephant. And so meditation is a kind of elephant taming. And, and Jonathan uses this to describe a, a couple of things. The, the first is that we like to think of ourselves as the conscious rider planning ahead, making informed choices. But in fact, we are also the elephant. We can't just split that off and say we'll rise above it because it's actually a really important part of how our minds work. We would be nothing without the elephant. As Jonathan puts it, um, the, the, the elephant is much more sophisticated. It's been good through a lot more iterations of code. It's much more powerful. And this is why we've managed to build a, a computer that can outplay the cleverest human being alive at chess, but we haven't built a robot that can walk through a forest with anything like the dexterity of a four-year-old child those systems are just more complicated. And, and the other point about this is that the elephant is much bigger. If the elephant wants cake, the elephant will get cake. And so you have to have a good relationship with it. And we work with a lot of people, I'm sure you've met plenty yourself, who have extremely clever riders and are riding around on the back of a totally out of control elephant. Did I mention we do a lot of work with investment banks? <laughs> or to put it another way, 
If you want to be successful in your life and work, you need to take care of your mind. Not just the rational bit, not just getting better at maths, but taking care of your well-being, your emotional state, feeding your mind in a much more organized and conscious way. And so that's what this is all really about. So what do we need to do about this? How can we put this into practice? I will just give you a few things to ponder, ways that we could actually take some of these and the many, many other insights that we're starting to learn out into society and into our companies, and then we'll hopefully have a, a conversation about that. Uh, the first is to know that what we do makes a difference. So actually, you make a good contribution to the state of your mind through your own choices, and we collectively, as, a, as communities, as a society, make a big contribution to our collective uh, health and well-being. And so we need to get a grip on that. We need to be thinking, what do each of us need to feel good in our minds, and what can we do on a day-to-day -day basis to look after that? And, and actually, it's not so much about remembering a whole checklist of things that the science says. There's so much research about all the different things that are good for your mind that it almost becomes reductive after a while. Hugging is apparently very good for you. Who knew? Extraordinary work. Um, you know, if, if you ever meet anybody who says that they need a scientific evidence base to hug you, avoid those people. They're a bit weird. Um, there, there is lots of evidence that retail therapy is good for boosting your mood. It doesn't necessarily mean it will help with the national debt, but still, you know, it's useful at times. But we wouldn't necessarily want to prescribe it on the, on the NHS. You're feeling sad? Go buy some shoes. It's fine. We all know that we buy shoes because we're depressed. We try to deny that, but we know it's true. And there is even a, a peer-reviewed study that says that watching Lord of the Rings is good for alleviating depression. But only if you like Lord of the Rings. Otherwise, it's a bit depressing. And, and so the point about this is that actually it's about whatever works for you. These things all work much better if you have chosen them and you enjoy them. And so think about the breathers and restorers that you need and make time for that. Give yourself permission to manage your mind. It's not something we're very good at a lot. We tend to think of it as something we should do once the work is finished. But in fact, it's key to getting the work done in the first place. And it's a false economy to neglect it. Employers can make a big difference, and this is, I think, where we come in, what the book's been about and what we support a lot of companies to try and get better at. So actually, we can be educating staff and managers about how our minds work, informing them about these insights and helping them to put them into practice to work smarter and more sustainably. It's about promoting a culture of that that comes from the top of organizations. We've started to get um, chief executives and senior leaders talking about how they've had problems with their minds, but I want to hear more people talking about what they're doing that's good for their minds. How do they manage themselves? How did they get there? What can we learn from them? These people are role models, and actually they could set a really positive tone for their companies and for the wider society around them. And we need to give people the flexibility and the permission to manage themselves. It's not enough to just say it's all time-wasting. Actually, if you've got people at their desk because they need to be seen to be at their desk, but they can't think straight, and really they'd be better off going for a walk for five minutes, let them go for a walk. It's just silly not to. And then finally, education can make a big difference. And I think it's appropriate to be talking about that in the RSA. There are a lot of educationalists in, in our network, in our fellowship, and we do a lot of work in, in academies and schools. And actually, this is the sort of thing that ultimately does end up being a basic part of public education. This is as fundamental a part of public health education as learning about germs on your hands or plaque on your teeth or cholesterol in your diet or cutting out on sugar and salt. And yet, when it comes to school, I don't know what, quite what you experienced, but I just got draw, draw a neuron and then flipped to dissecting a frog again. I got very little about the mind. And we can change that now. We're not using schools enough for the things that they are good at, which is teaching knowledge and assessing understanding. We could be doing a great deal more that teachers would be very, very well equipped to do and probably are already doing in small ways or want to do more of. And we can teach people generally in, in, in the world about how their minds work and how to make informed choices. And we can put the health and performance of our minds at, at the centre of the way that we organise our institutions, our companies, our society. If we started thinking a bit more about that, then perhaps we wouldn't have so many problems in the first place. And when you consider that mental health problems now cost the country well over £100 billion a year, and yet we don't really have anything resembling a national public mental health campaign, there's a clear, quick win there. Uh, someone asked me once at a, at a talk like this whether I was a glass half full or a glass half empty person, to which my response was annoyingly, I'm a glass half empty person and I can't wait to use that space. Because I don't really understand what's so depressing about empty glasses anyway. I mean, no one walks into a pub and goes, God, it's so depressing, there's lots of empty glasses in here. A pub without empty glasses, that's depressing. And the point about this is actually there are so many things we have got right in other areas of public health that we could get right in mental health. And I don't think it's that complicated, and I think we should get on with it. But really what this boils down to is building institutions that work with human nature 
and not in spite of it. We get a lot done despite not really giving ourselves a break or designing things around the way that we know that we work. Imagine how much better we could do as individuals, as companies, as an economy, if we actually thought about designing around our basic nature and made it easy for us to contribute everything that we can. What would change in the way that we work from that? So I will leave it at that, and then we can have a chat, and Ewan and I can have a conversation about humanizing business, perhaps, and various other things, and I hope you will join us in that. But I will leave you with a thought, which is, our slogan at Mind Apples is to make looking after our minds as natural as brushing our teeth. And someone did point out that this, this child has no teeth, and is <laughs> perhaps the wrong child to use to illustrate this point, but we left him in anyway. Uh, but you think about, if, let's use the analogy of dental health to mental health, because it's only one letter different, so we can steal all the research, right, it's fine. And if you think about how much worse it is for your mind to fall apart than for your teeth to fall out, how much more destructive it is for your work, your relationships, your life, how much harder it is to fix, then why do we have a $31 billion global dental hygiene market and no equivalent vertical for looking after our minds? The will is there. We know people want it. It's time for everyone to start stepping up and providing it. And I hope you will join me in that. And also, please do buy the book. It's very good, and they make excellent gifts. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And over coffee, a couple of the older participants were sort of dismissing that and saying, well, you know, my dad knew stress. He was having to work hard to support a whole family and we didn't have enough money and, you know, stress isn't a new thing. Is it, is it changing? Is the nature of the stresses that we're feeling shifting? Is that why we're more interested in our minds? Perhaps, or it may be that we have more choice. And so actually we can see a way out of it now. We perhaps maybe we didn't see that before. I mean, I'm, I'm a historian originally by, by background and, and I'm always a bit wary when people start talking about how it's worse now than it's ever been. Yeah. Um, partly because you ask them, well, would you like to go back to the 1950s then? And no one, no one would like to do that. That mm -hmm. would be terrible. Um, but I guess partly because of the, the end of history phenomenon. Every generation thinks they're experiencing worse problems than any generation in history and that you know, the, the, there's no way we'll ever overcome it and that each generation seems to say the same thing. But I mean, I think, I think perhaps it's the, 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 the things that we're worried about are more complicated and we have a bit less control over our lives and our environment. The, the bigger the... Our, our scope gets, the, the wider our net of communication, the, the more things that are way beyond our control seem to affect our lives, where the price of, price of bread or the price of a, pe uh, uh, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a tank of petrol is actually affected by things that we just see, but not see on the news and we can't really do anything about. It puts us in a very vulnerable place, I think, whereas if you, that, that slightly simpler way of living at least doesn't cause quite that anxiety. I think it's a trade-off that we're willing to make, though. Okay. I think it's quite... We would rather, quite obviously, have iPhones and the internet and know what's going on in the Middle East than to just be ignorant and enjoy farming our vegetable patch. Well, well but we would, but, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about both of us having sort of come through the early adopter phases of all, yeah. all sorts of technologies. And it's interesting how many, and myself included, of our peers are becoming more interested in mindfulness and meditation and ways of switching it all off. Um, so we're obviously having to adapt to cope with the volume and the complexity of the things that we're, we're dealing with. Yeah, there's some very interesting um, work on email and how email is addictive, but we're all digital uh, tools. Tom Stafford at Mindhacks has a lovely piece on this that says that email is addictive because it gives you variable rewards. So it's like a lucky dip. Every time there's a little beep in the corner, you <laughs> think, I wonder if that's something terrible or something brilliant. And so you have to check it, and that becomes a habit. And yes. so the anxiety caused by that spread network means that we do need to get better at pulling ourselves back in and understanding our nature a bit more. And yes. I don't think it's any surprise that the more technology starts to become a visible part of our lives, the more we also get interested in our humanity yes. and start to really need to build up that as well. And I think that's the movement that's happening now is we need to start recognising that it's we've got a design around our nature. We can't just upgrade ourselves or say, oh, it's fine, we'll just get on with it. Interesting. And something else you mentioned, you touched on the elephant and, and the rider and the, and the Buddha and, and Buddhist philosophy. And of course, part of that is caring for each other. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the other aspects in the book are sort of the collective responsibility of mental health for each other. Talk a bit more about that. Yeah, one of, the, one of the slides that I wanted to put in but didn't want to fill it too much with with content is, is that we're all in this together and actually the, the research is very clear that it's not just enough to look after your own health and well-being. Actually you will be empathising with the things you see other people experience. You will be picking up moods from your colleagues, your family, your friends. So mm -hmm. actually we do need to start thinking about how to look after ourselves as, as a collective uh, self, not just as an individual self, yeah. just from, from you know, purely practical reasons. But I think what's, what I'm not clear about, which I would be very interested to see how, it, how that develops, is how wide that net gets cast. You know, does, it, does it make a difference when we actually do know what's going on you know, in, yeah. in you know, Syria at the moment? Does that affect our well-being? How does it affect it? Does that mean we actually start to realise we need to take more responsibility for what's going on around the world, not just here? Or can we sort of shut it off and we can still live in our, our nice houses and feel that like everything's OK without really feeling the need to take action? How far do we need to go to, to actually looking at humanity as a collective? What sort of timescales do you think we're talking about in terms of that collective awareness? What sort of I suspect it's probably happening already. I think the question is how to research it. I think the timescales on researching that are much longer than the timescales of it happening. And I, I mean, I suspect the way, that, the way that the media has developed over the last few years, there's a bit of a lag going on. We don't quite know what effect it's having on us. And I think, I mean, I, I was always, I'm always wary of this sort of, you know, the internet is bad for us kind of talk. I don't think that's true. I think we will adapt. Just yeah. but, it, but it's this, it, we're the generation that have got to go through the pain of it. We're not, you know, we... we 
we, we've got to learn how to multitask more. We've got to understand what to do when there's all these things that we can't quite affect directly, but we're, we're aware of them. We've mm -hmm. got to manage a much wider social network, and, and we're getting there. And, you know, generations coming up uh, you know, now are much, much more intuitive at that, but we feel the pain of it. And I, it's, it, I think, I think it, it's, it's there. Change is already here. It's just not evenly yep. distributed yet. And, and again, there was much talk today about millennials, and, and mm. as, a, as a silver oh, surfer myself, I resisted that label. <laughs> but uh, around the consequences of, of for organisations of this stuff, and you, you alluded to that, um, I asked about the blocks for individuals. What's, mm. What are the hurdles you have to get over to get this taken seriously in organisations? It's, yeah, it's been interesting working with companies that um, uh, are trying to do something about this, because... That just taking the decision to take action doesn't necessarily make it all nice and smooth because there's still a lot of internal questions and we often have to prove ourselves at many different stages along the line that this is something staff will like, that every generation will like. I think the drivers that are pushing people to taking it more seriously is partly coming from the younger generation who are increasingly looking for a quality of life, not yeah. just yeah. paycheck. And so actually that's starting to be quite clear to these top employers that they need to take this stuff seriously, otherwise they're losing talent. And companies that haven't got that right are actually starting to feel the effects of it already. Yeah. And so it's interesting that MindApples has been mostly working with the number one companies in each sector. So it tends to be the leaders, the people who are trying to keep ahead, who right. are starting to take this stuff most seriously. And now we're starting to see other companies kind of jumping into it as well. So. I think that, that's where the driver coming through it. The, the, the barrier a lot of the time is, is not quite knowing what it's possible to change or, or whether it will open up a can of worms. I think that's the, well, that's the, the big that, fear. That was know? where my next question was yeah. going ahead because in a sense, uh, I took part in an event about complexity in neuroscience recently in business, which I came away feeling very uneasy from. Mm. It was going to perilously close to eugenics and all sorts yeah. of manipulative potential to get more efficiency out of, out of staff. I mean, what's, what's, what would the downside of this increased knowledge be? Uh, undoubtedly huge. I mean, you'll, you'll notice that we're trying to anchor it very much on trying to design around our humanity, and I think we need to keep making that point. It's not about trying to change people. It's about trying to change businesses and change society to suit people better, so we use the knowledge that way around. I mean, that, I think where this shows up most is, is probably resilience. Um, and that I, we hear a lot about resilience training and often we are hired to do resilience training and so it, you know, it can be a window into doing something very positive. But I worry a bit when I hear big city firms, for example, talking about resilience training and I look at their workforce and these are basically people who have got top marks at every stage through school, have gone to a high pressure university, nailed every bit of it, you know, lost sleep through all their exams, gone to seven interviews where people have done all kinds of strange things to them, done an internship or an apprenticeship, all kinds of different things and they, you know, they've not slept you know, for, mm -hmm. for weeks and weeks and still been able to proofread stuff in spite mm -hmm. of the company trying to make it as impossible as, as they can for them. Yeah. And then they say, how do we make these people more resilient? To which the answer is, you shouldn't. <laughs> you should be nicer to them. You know, you, law firms, for example, you couldn't design a system for making it harder to do legal work than most junior roles in a law firm. You, know, you might as well say, right, you've got to sit on this, on this metal chair in the middle of an electrified wet room whilst we turn the lights on and off and we <laughs> blare a klaxon in your ear and threaten your family with a gun and then proofread that. Go on. And like, maybe we could just try actually being calm and seeing what we could bring out of people. You know. So the potential for doing, using it that way is, is, is huge, but we mustn't let them. Well, I, I was just going to end on an optimistic note before I open it up to, to the rest of the audience, but because um, you know, it feels in so many aspects of our lives these days that we're coming to the end of a set of stories that have helped make sense of work, life, and everything. And obviously conscious where we're sitting and the, you know, the whole thing about the printing press leading to the Enlightenment and the Reformation and the, the modern scientific worldview. If we're on that sort of a path, what do you think are the, what's the big game? What's the sort of story that we can be aiming for with this? It's very interesting to think of stories, actually. I've not put it in those terms. We talk about explanatory frameworks and language, but actually the story of this mm -hmm. is quite important. And, and, and I think it, you know, I, we're, we're sort of reaching for it. I, th I think probably the story I would go for that is the, the, sort of the big overarching story in all this is if we look at the way that we've designed our economic system, which work is, is clearly the output, we focus very much on the demand side of our economy. 
And so we have got to the point where really we are given everything that we could possibly want as consumers. But we've sort of forgotten that we're also the supply side of that economy. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of becoming slaves to ourselves, where <laughs> we're going around you know, with wonderful new technology and we all have fantastic televisions, but we work incredibly long hours and we never see our kids. Yeah. And, and somehow we've got to remember that we're both sides of the equation, yeah. particularly as we broaden out to think more globally. But actually, it's not just about the quality of our life. It's about the quality of our work. Interesting. Excellent. Thank you. Now, we have the opportunity for, for questions from the audience. There are a couple of roving microphones. Uh, a request, which I will reiterate if we don't quite manage it, is that you wait for the microphone before asking your question so that those who are following us uh, online on the streaming feed can hear your questions. But chap at the back to the right there. Andy, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Andy. An eloquent and impassioned speech. Uh, very nice. Thank yes, you. Um, we're creating at the RSA a, a mindfulness network to educate fellows and take mindfulness out into our schools, healthcare, and so forth. Uh, other than buying an autographed copy of your book, Which what, I hear is that <laughs> what advice would you have for us as we build our network out? Uh, I think. One of the things we've found trying to build a network at MindApples is that there are a lot of people who really want you to succeed. And so something we used to talk about in the days of, you know, uh, the early days of the internet is how are you letting the people who want you to succeed help you? And so rather than telling stories to all of your community about how successful you're being, uh, actually talk about what you need help with and how they can get involved. If you can create simple things to get people involved, that's, that's what we found. I, I, went, I gave a talk to some young volunteers once, which um, uh, I, I, sort of, I think I unwisely compared changing the world to the bottom of a pint glass. I said that actually the, changing, the, the key to changing the world is at the bottom of a beer glass, um, but only a particular type. Sometimes you get uh, glasses which have a cross hatching on them. And the, the purpose for that in lager glasses and in champagne flutes as well is that they make it fizzier, because if you have this slight etching on the bottom of the glass, it gives a point for all of the energy that's trapped in the liquid to coalesce, and then it forms bubbles more easily. And so we think of mind apples a bit like that. It's just a little little etch on, on the, the, the bottom of reality that allows all the people who are thinking, wouldn't it be good if we all looked after our minds better, to kind of go, oh, yeah, over here. If I come, come to that event, then we can, I can meet all the people like me. So that's one thing, I think, finding all those like-minded people. The other thing, though, that I think is as important is talk to all the people who disagree with you. I think we're far too good in the, this sort of sector at talking to all the people who think this is great, and we all go to the same conferences, and all of them have programs that are sort of slightly pink, and everyone's smiling a lot, and we talk about well-being, and everyone says, isn't this great? And then we all go home again feeling very good about ourselves, and, and, and then you know, life continues on. And where do we get to the naysayers? How do we talk to the people who think this is self-indulgent and stupid, and how do we have a debate about it, and how do we bring everybody on board. If, it, if, if mindfulness is just something like recycling has been a bit that only middle class people do, then we've lost. It needs to be something that isn't tribal, that's for everyone. So don't even think of changing the world until you've had a pint. <laughs> yes, um, well, yes. There's a lady yes. there in the purple. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Maria. I don't think this is working. No, that's, that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, so my question is, you mentioned that you work with companies, and I'm quite interested to find out what kind of changes they've made as a result of the work that you've done with them. Um, the reason why I ask is because I co-founded a psychology magazine called Mind of Success, and we aim to apply psychology research practically into life and to give people recommendations to see if they can improve their quality of life. Uh, so it would be quite interesting to hear how people can take that further rather than just listening to an article and what kind of steps they actually take to implement those great findings? Yes, thank you. It's a good question about what, what practically do our clients and companies that are applying this stuff you know, act, actually do differently. And I think it's, it's very complex and divergent. That's one of the interesting things about this work. It doesn't all point in one direction, which makes it quite hard to measure, actually, because the feedback we've had from MindApple's training sessions has been so diverse. You know, we've had people saying, you know, this has helped me to explain what I'm doing to my husband better, or this now allows me to you know, talk to my manager properly about all the things I'm worried about. But we've also had people saying, I've, it's made me realize my manager's terrible. He does everything the opposite of what you said, and I don't know what to do about it. And you know, we, we, we've even sorted out someone's golf swing. You know, so people take from it all these extraordinary things, and it's difficult to know what that adds up to. But I guess I'm kind of a believer in you know, that, that 
culture eat strategy for breakfast. And so I think it's about the way that individual people seeing the world differently starts to ripple through. And if you can get a whole of a team or you know, the manager and, and the people who work for them all talking the same language about something, then they'll start behaving differently and talking about it differently without even noticing that they're doing it. An example I often use is talking about stress. So we, 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 talk, we, do, we do a lot of sessions talking to people about how to handle pressure and, and, and manage stress better. As you can imagine, it's, it's a big problem in the type of businesses we, we work with. We even talk about them as being um, large, uh, high-pressure, knowledge-intensive businesses, the kind of places where they know the value of their minds and, and they want to try and extract as much value from them as possible. And we talk to them about fear responses and, and how actually when you're stressed about something, it's because you're afraid of a threat. And so it's a bit like being attacked by a tiger. And because it's a light way of talking about it, you find that then the team, we've gone back later and they're still talking about tigers. They're saying, actually, where's the tiger this week? Oh, the tiger's that, that division, or the tiger is that, that trader over there. And, you know, and what about this, this big project that management want? Oh, that's, that's more of a kitten, actually. You know? And it becomes playful. I think as soon as it becomes something that people can use to make sense of reality, then it becomes useful. We talk a bit about mentalization. I mean, that's, that's one of the areas that I guess would relate to what we're talking about. Your ability to uh, accurately understand what's going through your mind or someone else's mind and relate that to behavior. And I think that's where to start. If you use these insights to help people go, oh, that's why I do that. That's why I eat cake on a Friday. That's why my boss is, is so stressed at the moment. Or in, in case of beyond the work, that's why my mum's shouting at me. You know, these things make sense of the world, and then we learn and we learn and we learn. I think that's where, that's where the most impact has been. For and sometimes just having the words for... Exactly. I mean, the language is so important. We, we don't have much of a language for talking about our minds, and, and actually, it's quite simple to introduce it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, and it's quite fun, and it's mm -hmm. a relief a lot of the time. Indeed. So, oh, that's what it's called. I've been yeah. feeling it for 40 years, and I <laughs> didn't know there was a name for it. You know? yeah. It's amazing what you can achieve by just making people feel normal. I mean, we, just as an aside, we've been doing training, uh, the same content that we've been doing with top uh, execs in companies with nursing and social care students at London South Bank and with long-term users of mental <coughs> health services through the NSUN network and evaluating that. The University of York have been writing that up for us. And the feedback we've had just from talking to people about the basic functionings of how everyone's minds work, from people who've been you know, very unwell at points and unemployed for years. You know, we've had people coming up saying, I've learned more from this last hour than I have in 20 years of therapy and personal development. Fantastic. It's amazing what just feeling normal and having a few words for things can do for us. Excellent. So, Good chat there. Uh, in the pale blue shirt, I think. I hope this is um, easy. I think it's very difficult. Can this be applied to communities? I'm working with a very um, deprived um, area of community and uh, these issues are very apparent there, the yes. health issues mm. all these other things which you, you recognize in business. Can it be applied to a community which doesn't have the leader and the leadership and the management models that business does? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and so Mind Apples is a non-profit. We started very much from a perspective of how do we change popular culture, not just, you know, we're not in the business of trying to be as exclusive as possible. So it's, it's a question we ask a lot. On the campaign side of what we've done, we've managed to turn things into toolkits. So actually, most of our impact of getting people to think positively about the health of their mind and share the five a day for their mind is actually being done by other organizations. So we're in over 50 universities, like local, local action groups use them. So the, the campaign side, I think, is scalable. The next question is, how do we get the knowledge out? And short of it being you know, on the national curriculum, which I think it ultimately will end up being, if anyone can agree on which bits of neuropsychology are permitted to be on the curriculum, then we could start teaching it. Um, I, 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 think, I think the knowledge works. I don't think we found that it's an elitist thing. I think you know, we respect people with you know, the truth, and actually people respond really well to that. Um, it's about the mechanics of getting it out there. And I think it's probably, we, we, I spoke to um, uh, Chris, who runs basic needs, and he was suggesting that we need to take kind of an, a development approach. They run um, projects for, to provide mental health support in the developing world. And actually, it's surprising how much we could learn in the developed world yeah. about how they're doing it, which is mostly train the trainer and working with local structures and communities already. So if we could provide simple support to help people who are already working with communities or respected by communities to, to just say, what do you think of this model? And I'll explain a bit of it and let's talk about what it means for us. We might start to get that, that change. So that's, that's our, our next step. Well, it, it also touches on how often 
you just lift the lid on issues in society generally, and there's some mental health issues below that. You know, I've been involved with homelessness charities, and one of the main reasons for homelessness is, is mental challenges. So, and it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Yeah. One leads to the other. Un unemployment's the same. The worst yeah. thing that you know for your mind is to end up unemployed. You know, it's it's terrible for you. you know, just yeah. might, we might find work stressful, but it's much yeah. worse being out of work. Totally. In some ways, it's also the worst thing that you can possibly have for your mental health is to receive public services. Those things are terribly bad for your health. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Dwayne Barraker, a corporate social responsibility consultant. Hi, um, Dwayne. Two hard questions for you, I think. Excellent. Uh, firstly, it strikes me that this is more apposite in, in big companies. Lots of startups do this reasonably well, actually, or at least think about some of this stuff much better than big ones. What are the one or two KPIs that will mean that middle management takes this as seriously as the rest of the business does? Uh, and just as hard a question, who's going to win the Cricket World Cup? <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I'll take them in reverse order. Who, who do you want to win? <laughs> Not them. That would be it. No. <laughs> um, uh, no, it will be, it will be interesting. As, as a Scotsman, talking about cricket and mental health in this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Scotland. I think Scotland will win it. That, that, would, be, that would be fantastic. Um, well, you won Wimbledon, so you know, I mean, it's stranger things have happened, right? Um, I mean, KPIs, are, uh, they're so difficult for this stuff because it's so diffuse. It, it, it cuts across so many different things. So, you, you know, we, we could measure stress levels, but actually that doesn't tell you about productivity. You can measure individual level things, but that doesn't tell you about collaboration. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that there's some knowledge uh, uh, KPIs to, to be measured. There's some stuff which is just simply, um, you know, do you feel you know how to deal with the pressure that you're under? You know, do you feel as a manager equipped to support people in your team to do their best work? Um, and I think really what we're pushing for is everyone doing the best work of their career for the company. And quite how you measure that, I'm not sure, but it, that, that's the real goal. It's not just about feeling good. Um, it's, it's about you know, actually doing an amazing job at the same time. Um, I mean, I think probably at the moment the things that companies are capable of measuring easily, uh, I think engagement plus either stress or well-being, the, the, two, the axes of the two interact quite helpfully. You know? So um, if you've got very high engagement and, and high stress, then people will burn out. If you've got you know, high stress and low engagement, people will just say it's more than my job's worth, who cares? Um, if you've got the two together, then you get sustainable working. So that's sustainable engagement is, is for me, but it's, you've got to measure the two. And because stress in particular is so related to um, the things you care about, you know, if the more you care about your work, the more likely you, know, you care about your colleagues, you care about doing a good job, you care about your clients, the more likely you are to get stressed. What we're finding is that focus on engagement has created more of a stress problem. And actually, maybe if we just focus on stress whilst also keeping all of the engagement work together, we may find we get most of the way there, or at least a good stab at it. But um, KPIs are. Yeah, I'd be, yeah, be, be really nervous about that. I mean, the whole thing about business is measuring KPIs and stuff. And again, today, somebody was saying that of the transformation projects that HR are involved in, only 20% are successful, 80% fail. And you know the whole employee engagement thing, you know the thought of having some manager lunging at you in the canteen because his numbers aren't looking good enough. I mean, if we had a mental health manager in an organisation, that that would be a a retrograde step in many respects. It depends on the on, on the outcome of it. I mean, I I, I think it can, it, the, one of the questions that we're often asking is about privacy, and so how far yeah. is it actually the business of your employer, how you're feeling? And I remember mm -hmm. being at a, a debate about happiness at work where I. I said, do you, do you, I asked one of the consultants there, do you think it's actually, you know, do you think I'm accountable to you for how I feel? And this woman said, yes. And I, and I was appalled by that. I think I'm accountable for what I do and the impact yeah. I have on how other people feel, but I can feel how I damn well like. So the yeah. more we can measure outputs, yeah. the better, the yeah. safer it is. But it's quite hard to know exactly what those outputs are. Ultimately, I think this is a chief exec issue, though. It should be about knowing what mental state your employees are. Having been on the board of the RSA for a couple of years, we were really starting to try and get a grip on what is the mental state of everybody coming to work. Are they feeling calm? Are they feeling energized? Are they enthusiastic? How are they feeling? Because then you notice it in the wonderful work that people mm. then produce. It's up at the back. Sorry. Thanks, Andy. Could you talk a little bit about the formal work you may be doing in education? And I ask the question because I'm a trustee of a, a music education charity that's based in London. Mm. 
We talk endlessly about the challenge. Uh, there's a catastrophic drop-off presence of music from primary to secondary. Head teachers just can't fit it in. What are you doing? What, are the, what sort of conversations are you guys having with the education sector that are practical and what, what do you think they might lead on to? I'd, I'd love to be able to help you more with it, but I don't, we're not actually working actively in schools. What we're doing is going around the back door and getting individual teachers um, and parents buying toolkits and, and introducing them into the school without uh, the school necessarily having a say in it. We do get occasional champions. Um, I, I think... It, would though? I mean, some of you get involved? Yeah, we, we would, ultimately, as I say, I think a lot of this does end up you know, in, in schools. I think it's a basic health education requirement. I think, you know, once we've got this science a little bit more settled, I think it's, it's, you know, it's already at the point where people are craving it. And we spoke to the RSA Academy about maybe doing something, you know, there at, at, at some point. But, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, th I think that the school's uh, world is so competitive because, uh, obviously, it's very political. Uh, ultimately, at the moment, it's been very driven by what parents are asking for, and that's what the government have been paying attention to. Um, and, and for us, as a small organisation, it's, it's quite difficult to, you know, to, to get our elbows into that, and we wouldn't want to go, go slowly mad fighting against all these much, much larger fish in a, in a, in a huge pond. Um, I, I think, I guess my, my plea is that we should use schools for what they're really good at and we'd like to help with that. I, I think we probably are in the territory where we'd very much like some people to steal our idea and just do it, and we won't aspire to get rich off it, and we won't aspire to get the credit for it. We just, you know, just get on with it. You know, Michael Gove can do it. You know, he can come back in a blaze of glory and decide it would be great to teach everybody how their minds work. Wouldn't that be fun? I'd, I'd love that, really. Mm. <laughs> True one. <laughs> the lady near the front here. I suspect this, this may be our last, last question. So, yeah. The pressure. Um, thanks very much for that talk. That was really interesting. I do work in schools and I work um, for the NHS as well in mental health and in mindfulness. Um, there's something very seductive about learning about how our mind works and, yeah. and then this idea that we can make changes in that field and ultimately feel better. I think there's something problematic as well in the sense it can de-responsibilise some of the wider bodies like the government and other organisations that have a big impact mm. also on our, men on our mental health. And the, the, the impact of social and economic and political uh, factors in how we feel is just as important, I think, as kind of our individual days and what, what we eat and that kind of thing. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, I could... I I, I agree, I could take this as a comment, but I'll, I'll add to it if, if you like. And, and also, you know, thank, thanks for saying seductive. I, you know, that's, that's a great word. I'm very pleased with that. Um, I, th I think that, that, that I, think, I think the, um, uh, so one of the things that, you know, I, I have the, the, the rather wonderful distinction of having been accused of being a self-appointed happiness guru on Radio 2, which I think everyone should try once. It's a very fun thing to do. Um, and it, it, the temptation is to say that, um, all of this focus on individual responsibility kind of lets everyone else off the hook. Um, and th so there's a balance to be struck because actually the flip side of it is that people who've been told that they should just take medication or that experts are the only people who can sort them out or they've got some kind of permanent problem with their personality find it incredibly useful to be told that there's something that they can do that would help them. The problem is the politicising of that and I think it's, it's quite... It's striking, for example, that there's a lot of talk about um, what, you know, mental health being a big issue, but in, in fact very, very little talk about public mental health. There's not very much going on in that, that field at the moment. And, and I think part of it is about trying to help educate people about what they can do, but also the result of having a more educated population will be it puts more pressure on institutions and on the government. That's certainly my hope anyway. I, mean, I guess I sort of believe in the democracy of that. Because once you realize all the different things that are affecting your mind and how sensitive it is, you start to ask questions about you know, public safety and the economy and what the government is doing about health service provision and aging. And you know, these things start to become more important because actually in some ways, we're sort of shrugging them off at the moment. We're going, you know, we should all just knuckle down and you know, it's tough times and we've got to get tough you know, and actually that can not just affect our health, but it affects our, our performance in, in our jobs and things like that. I mean, it's, it's, it would be lovely if we measured as a general overall uh, KPI for the Prime Minister the, uh, the mental 
illness levels of a country. If you go back through all the different prime ministers we've had, I wonder which of them would come out best on that measure. It would be a fascinating thing to, to test, and I invite you actually all to, to go out, you know, whilst you're watching these politicians asking us for, their, you know, for our votes, then ask them questions about this. Ask what they're doing about mental health. Ask what their plans to spend are. What are they doing about educating and supporting people to, to live healthily? And, and do do their work better, live well. You know, it's it's a great opportunity, I think, to put pressure back. But we need to educate ourselves. And also, you can't change the world if you're too depressed to get out of bed. So, on some level, you've just got to try and figure out how to get on with it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I believe there are copies of the book available in the vicinity. There, there are available, and I will be signing copies outside, which um, is, has been uh, it's been really worrying me because I've got to get my author signature right. It's um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I've not had to have an author signature before. Otherwise, I'll have to give you my signature I use for the bank, which is apparently not the done thing. So um, I'm looking forward to trying that out. So yeah, the the the, the book the book is called A Mind for Business, and uh, it's it's I guess the, it's the summary of all of the different things that we found are most useful for people in business about how the mind works and so hopefully there will be something in it for everyone and I'm happy to ask questions but I, I will only talk to people from this point if you can produce a receipt. <laughs> <laughs> and do join me in thanking Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.